Hey guys, how's it going? Wonderful, how are you? I'm doing pretty well. Thanks for asking. What were we talking about last time? Euthyphro, right. Euthyphro continued. And how far did we get? We got, like, we found out, we went through the introduction, right? Yeah. What goes on in the introduction again? Yeah, why is he there? Why is he there? And why is he, and who's he? And who's he? Euthyphro asks Socrates why he's there. Why is Socrates there? And where is there? King Archon's court. Yeah, King Archon's court. And why is he there? Yeah, he, oh, get him. Rob, 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 Rob. Yeah, it's, he's, he's exactly just like you guys said. He's being prosecuted for corrupting the youth of Athens. And, uh, as we'll see, the, the exact charges are corrupting the youth of Athens and denying the old gods while inventing new false gods. Euthyphro's there to prosecute his father for murder. Murder. What's that? Perhaps. Or maybe his father got corrupted. Um, and this whole thing gets going because Socrates is like, whoa, that's surprising that you're prosecuting your own father for murder. A lot of people would say that they'd have a hard time knowing that that was the right thing to do. And Euthyphro is like, I don't have a hard time at all. I'm quite confident that what I'm doing is the right thing. It's the pious thing. And Socrates is like, the pious thing. That sounds like valuable information. You know what the pious is? And Euthyphro says, yeah, die, of course. And so much more about the gods. And Socrates is like, maybe some other time tell me about the gods. But right now, tell me about what the pious is. Because this is going to be very, very useful to me, seeing as I'm on trial for basically impiety. And Euthyphro proceeds to teach Socrates exactly what the pious is. No trouble whatsoever. It's a great dialogue that demonstrates effective teaching by Euthyphro to Socrates. No, 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 no. I'm being a little ironic there, right? Socratically ironic. Euthyphro has offered two answers thus far about what the pious is. What are those answers? Prosecuting the wrongdoer, yeah. No matter what. How about these new markers, right? It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Prosecuting the wrongdoer, no matter what. This perhaps sounds like a good idea. Real question is, is it the pious? And is it the pious? How do we know it's not the pious? Do you know what the pious is? That you can tell the difference between the pious and the non-pious? Yes? If the only qualification for what the pious thing is is that you're punishing the wrong or prosecuting the people who have done wrong, you haven't defined a, something that divides piety from impiety. You just like, said this is a pious act. Well, but doesn't Euthyphro say that, oh, you're on the right track. Euthyphro does say to fail to prosecute the wrongdoer would be impious. We have distinguished piety from, well, we've, we've distinguished one pious act from one impious act, perhaps, right? Are there no acts of piety that, ha that have to do with something other than prosecuting the wrongdoer? Gretchen. Yeah, so we've got this problem that, like, and maybe that's okay. Maybe Euthyphro's given his answer, it's to prosecute the wrongdoer. And Socrates says, yeah, but who are the wrongdoers? And is like, yeah, I know, that's the tricky part, but I, I'm not wrong that that's the pious. Turns out that it seems like maybe he is wrong that this is the pious, and mostly because it seems like they're, it's just one example, right? It's not even that, well, we have a bigger question about like what exactly constitutes wrongdoing and who the wrongdoers are, but this isn't even piety in its entirety, right? It's not the essence of piety. It's not a definition of piety that covers all cases. It only covers Euthyphro's case, which, you know, 
Maybe it's understandable. Euthyphro's got a little bit of tunnel vision, right? He's concerned with his case. So when you ask him what piety is, he's going to talk about it in terms of like what's relevant to him. Socrates wants to know about what's relevant to him, to Socrates, and in fact, tell me about piety in general. And we haven't really done it yet. Yes? Can you say piety is the God's love and That's answer number two, right? Yeah, so answer number two... Piety is what is loved by the gods. And impiety is what they hate, right? Maybe a better answer. And again, Socrates is in the same position as he was before. He is going to critique this, but he can't critique it by saying, that ain't the pious, because Socrates himself doesn't know. What is his, like, how does he, how does he come back at this, Dark? The gods must like and dislike different things, right? They can't all like and dislike the same thing. In fact, Euthyphro himself just said it earlier on in the dialogue that the gods quarrel with one another, right? So if they like and dislike different things, now we've got this issue where, like, perhaps Euthyphro has walked right into a naked contradiction. At the very least, he hasn't really told Socrates what the pious is. He's told him those things that are both pious and impious at the same time. Uh, because there could be something that some of the gods love, and that same thing would be something that some of the gods hate. So now I've got something that is both loved and hated by the gods, and according to this definition, that would be both pious and impious at the same time. Mm, that's a problem. Euthyphro responds, though. He's like, but surely there are some things that all the gods will agree upon about what they love and what they hate. There are things that they quarrel about, true. Socrates says, all right, let's call those things neither pious nor impious. And I guess the pious is the thing, those things that all the gods love, and the impious is those things that all the gods hate. So Euthyphro's got a good answer then, right? It could be called an answer. It's an answer. Is it a good answer? Has he taught Socrates what the pious is. He just, he just gave him a quality of the pious. Yeah, exactly. Why has he just given him a quality of the pious? Well, we talked about how Socrates asks Euthyphro what seems like a really difficult and complicated question. He says, wait a minute, hold on. Do you mean to say that piety is what is loved by the gods because the gods love it? Like, that's what makes something pious. Something is pious because the gods love it, or do the gods love it because it's pious? This is known as the Euthyphro dilemma. It's this, it's this either-or dilemma, right? Socrates says, like, wait, is it this or is it this? And it seems like perhaps Socrates is assuming that it's only one of those two things, right? It can't be both, can't be neither, some third thing, that either something is pious because the gods love it or the gods love it because it's pious. And what does Euthyphro say? Gods love it because it's pious, and now we see, like, this is why this only gives me a quality of the pious, then. If the gods love something because it's pious, that doesn't tell me why pious things are pious, right? It doesn't give me an adequate account. It doesn't give me a full logos that answers to this question of, like, what is the, like, what is the essence of piety itself, right? As I mentioned last time, it says if Socrates had said, what's a fire engine? And Euthyphro had said, fire engines are red. Perhaps it's true, but it doesn't tell you what a fire engine is, right? It only gives you a quality of fire engines. Okay. And we talked about how if Euthyphro had gone the other route on that dilemma, if he had said, okay, all right, I see there's trouble this way, so let's run the other way. Let's say that it's pious because the gods love it. What problem would he have run into there? Well, yeah, well, Euthyphro kind of sort of tries to diffuse the polytheism issue, right? By saying, perhaps the gods will all agree on some things. And that which they disagree on, that's outside of the realm of piety altogether. It's not pious, it's not impious, perhaps it's apious. But what does he say? Yeah. What would the problem with that be? Like, what is it? What, what are all these things that they agree upon? 
Um, that could be, yeah, or, like, yeah, I suppose. But, again, perhaps Euthyphro would have given the answer, right? I've told you what the pious is. I've even told you why it's pious. Pious things are pious because the gods love them. All the gods. Impious things are impious because all the gods hate them. All the gods. They disagree about some things, but that's neither here nor there. There's still an, an additional problem. Yeah, Stanton. Whoa, whoa, sacrilege. Are you suggesting that the gods don't know what they're doing and could be mistaken? Do we get the impression that Socrates would have said this? Yeah. Boy, talk about a demonstration of impiety to doubt the wisdom of the gods. I don't, I don't know if it gets a whole lot more impious than that. That is, n that is never said at any point during the dialogue. Socrates definitely doesn't say it. I'll warn you not to even think it privately. Yeah? If he had gone the other route and things are, say, things are pious because the gods love it, well, wouldn't that kind of defeat, like, any chance that he actually getting the definition at that point? Because how do you know exactly what the gods love? Okay, so yeah, this raises a problem, right? This raises a problem that, like, we would have to have privileged access to the minds of the gods, right? Or to the mind of God in order to know this. And the interesting thing about the way that this Euthyphro dilemma unfolds in this dialogue is that Socrates effectively just kind of, like, takes this off the table. Euthyphro opens up by bragging about, like, how much knowledge he has about the gods and their ways and what their minds are. And Socrates, is, like, does a little, like, feigned, impressed attitude, right? He's just kind of like, whoa, that's really cool that you know all this stuff, but then just kind of says like, eh, it doesn't really matter. We don't need to talk about what the gods love and what the gods don't love in order to talk about what is right and what is wrong. According to what Socrates is talking about here, this is a, if what's been done here is actually a sound argument, right? If, if what Socrates is running Euthyphro through doesn't pull any kind of fancy or dirty tricks, then this is a really momentous moment. Momentous moment? This is a huge step forward in philosophy in that we're able to kind of make our way around this question of who's got the right picture of the gods and what the gods are actually like. Perhaps we might be suspicious about this because I, I've, I've encountered a lot of people who claim to know and speak for God. They've said mutually contradicting things. Some of them, i got to be honest, I'm not sure if they're all there. <laughs> if suddenly today God started speaking to me, i got to be honest, I'd, I'd, I'd be concerned. One of my first trips would be to a psychologist. But again, that's neither here nor there. What we get here is this fork in the Euthyphro dilemma. Where Euthyphro goes this way, and we're wondering about what if he had gone this way? And actually, I, if I'm not mistaken, we came to this at the end of our discussion on, Mon on last week on Thursday, right? That this actually runs into a problem with a, a, an ethical framework known as divine command theory. And that problem is that it seems like it makes the commandments of God or like what God loves or what the gods love and what the gods hate as essentially arbitrary. There's just no rhyme or reason. Is that what you said? No, oh, you said something slightly different. You said then, like, the gods wouldn't know what they were talking about. No, I, like... Right, forgive, forgive me if I, if I misinterpreted what you said. That may, that may have been closer to what I said, but what I had meant was that, like, it doesn't really matter what the gods love or hate. It's just that, like, 
gods choose. So it's it, in that case, it's up to the gods for any reason to decide what is power. Right, and they could choose any old thing, right? They could choose injustice. They could choose the anti-commandments. Or God could have chosen anti-commandments. And according to this version of this moral principle, right? According to this side of the dilemma, we end up saying like, yeah, if God had said, thou shalt murder, then that's what's right. Because what makes something right or what makes something wrong is whether or not God says so. And whether or not God says so depends on nothing else. This is like the very definition of arbitrariness, right? There is no reason. Think of it in terms of, um, did we talk about this? Your parents telling you to clean your room? You did? No? Oh, okay. All right. Have you, your parents ever told you to do something and you said, like, why? And they said, because I said so. Because I said so. What a lovely answer for a parent to give a child. Because I said so. Is that true? If your mom says, or your dad says, clean your room, and you go, why? And they say, because I said so. Well, it's an answer. Yeah, is it a good one? Is it the real reason? That, like, whatever your parent, like, if my parents say, clean my room, then I ought to clean my room. And why? Is it because my parents know more than I do, and they have reasons of their own? They tell me to clean my room because it's a good idea to clean my room, or is it a good idea to clean my room because they say so? Why does a parent say, because I said so? Because they don't, yeah, because they don't feel like explaining it. Maybe because they don't know the reason. Maybe because they're just like, I don't want to encourage this questioning of my authority. That's, that might be like a really big part of it. Maybe it's because like, we don't have time. We, don't, we just don't have time. to. If it's like, don't cross the street, stay with me. And you're, the kid's like, why? We're like, this is not the time for a discussion. This is the time for like staying out of the street. Don't put that knife in the light socket. Why? Because I said so. That's why. I don't really have time to go into it. I think you're too young to understand. You're not capable of understanding the reasons. Maybe that's why a parent says because I said so. But at no point would we actually believe that it is literally because our parents said so. That that's what makes it right. Does that seem about, about right? Is that, is that a, a, a insightful assessment of what's going on when a parent says because I said so? There might be other reasons. But I'm pretty sure that none of the actual reasons for why they said that is because that's what makes it right, is your parents saying so. Now, granted, gods and God are not exactly the same as our parents. This could be a slippery analogy. Maybe one of the reasons why we're concerned about saying that our parents saying so is what makes it right is that we suspect that maybe our parents could make mistakes. Maybe we don't think the same sort of thing about God. But the principle still seems to stand. There's a difference between being a rule follower and being a rule understander, right? All I need to know in order to be a good rule follower is to do whatever the rules say or to do whatever the rule giver says. If I want to understand that, now I, I start entering into this question of like, okay, but what are the reasons behind the rules? This branch of the dilemma says there are no reasons behind the rules. The rules are the rules because the rule giver said so. And most of us are a little suspicious of this. This is actually a very difficult position to defend. Euthyphro perhaps wisely goes with the other dilemma, but it button hooks him, right? But it, it, it runs afoul of the definition that he gave. It, it demonstrates that this definition is in fact not really a definition. It's just a quality of what the pious is, not the essence of what the pious is. Okay. Good so far on answer one and two? Silent and hesitant nodding. Okay. Why not? And again, this is very, very valuable because, because we go this way, because we say the gods love it because it's pious, and now we're wondering, aha, so if it's not the gods love that makes something pious, it's something else. There's some other reason behind what makes the pious pious. Now we don't have to worry about whose account of the gods is actually correct. We've basically removed this question of religion from this discussion of morality or justice or 
whatever, whatever we're doing. This is important because if people disagree about religion, now they can actually have a conversation, right? If my version of the gods is different than your version of the gods, and our, the way that we determine what right action is, is because the god said so, you and I are going to have an unadjudicable disagreement, right? There's no progress that could possibly be made. It's going to bottom out in, well, this is my version of the gods, and you go, well, this is my version of the gods, and now we're wondering, well, who is actually right? And if we can't determine that, then the conversation's over. But if we go the other route, right? If we say that the gods love it because it's pious, there's still a conversation to be had. Despite any kind of disagreement, besides any kind of ignorance of what the nature of the gods are, what their minds are. Okay. Round about this time, Socrates says, okay, you silly man, you keep telling me you're going to teach me what piety is, but you keep not doing it. What gives here? All right, do you just not like me? What's, what's going on? And Euthyphro does something that a lot of Socrates' interlocutors do right about this time in a dialogue, in the early dialogues at least. Euthyphro blames Socrates for all of the problems. This is what I referred to as um, the ad hominem breakdown. Instead of keeping it on topic of what Euthyphro's answers are, instead of keeping it on topic about like the pious, now Euthyphro brings the argument to Socrates and, and what's going on with Socrates the person. He says, I know what the pious is, but every time I answer, you keep making my words move around in a circle. You're doing this to me, Socrates. And Socrates does a little aside where he's like, you perhaps, well, perhaps you're saying this because you know my father was a sculptor? <laughs> And in the fine tradition of Daedalus, I make statues that are... Do you guys know the story? Like Daedalus and Icarus? Daedalus was a sculptor who was so talented, his sculptures could get up and move around. We're actually going to get a reference to this again in Mino. Um, those sculptures are so lifelike, they would get up and move around. And Socrates is saying, like, is this what you're saying? That I make words get up and move around? I'm, I'm, I'm like Daedalus, but I do it with speech instead of with statues. If that were true, what I'm doing is even more impressive than what Daedalus does um, because I'm not doing it to my own statues, right? It's not my own words that I'm making move around. I'm making your words move around. This would be like Daedalus being such a talented sculptor that he can make other people's statues get up and move around. And furthermore, Socrates says, I don't even want your statues to move around or your words or whatever it is, like whatever this metaphor is trying to say. I want your words to stand still. I want you to teach me. I'm not trying to trick you here, man. I'm the one who wants to know. You're the one who knows. What possible motivation could I have for making your words move around? Perhaps from an outsider's perspective, we're looking at this and we're thinking to ourselves, dude, obviously, it's not Socrates making you throw his words move around. The words aren't even moving around. If it seems like Euthyphro's definitions come back and contradict themselves, it's because they were bad answers to begin with, right? Euthyphro was claiming to know, but by now it's starting to become quite obvious that he does not know. Socrates says, why can't you just, just give me the sort of answer that would actually help me? And Euthyphro says, I am not even really sure what you're, you know, he doesn't say, I'm not sure what the pious is. He says, I'm not sure what you're asking here. I'm not, I like, I keep giving you answers. You keep making my words move around in a circle. What do you want from me? Euthyphro asks. And Socrates says, well, let me see if I can help you help me a little bit. Socrates starts asking him some questions. Immediately, there's a little bit of a shift in the relationship here, right? Notice that Socrates hasn't really started doing anything outwardly different. Started out with, Euthyphro gives an answer, Socrates goes, huh, and asks questions, and in asking those questions, gets Euthyphro to realize that eh, his initial answer wasn't really that good. In Euthyphro's version of things, he makes the words move in a circle and come back and contradict themselves, right? This is what's known as the Alenchus.
cross-examination. It's a discursive method that Socrates employs in all, in fact, we could say that this is the heart and soul of the Socratic method, is somebody says something, we ask questions in a kind of a cross-examination style, and in asking those questions, we're going to put that claim to the test. Perhaps we'll show that just through asking those questions that uh, the claim doesn't really hold much water. We'll see a whole lot more. I'll, I'll be talking about the Olenkis all through our readings of Plato. And Socrates now is doing the same thing. He's just asking questions, but he's kind of doing it from a different position now. Instead of Euthyphro leads and Socrates kind of follows asking questions, now Socrates is kind of a head facing backwards asking the questions and trying to pull Euthyphro along. And the question that he starts off with is, seems like you keep talking about piety as if it's related to justice, right? You think that like, it's some, it has something to do with prosecuting the wrongdoer, bringing a murderer to justice, and that this is why what you're doing is right, because it's the pious thing? All right, I'll buy that. Seems like piety does have something to do with justice. But what's the relationship? Is piety a part of justice? Or is justice a part of piety? Yeah, Gretchen. Didn't he talk about like the square thing, or am I just saying that up? Where it's like a square mirror thing? Or if he didn't talk about it, isn't it kind of good? Yeah. So yeah, when we might wonder, like, is piety a part of justice or justice part of piety? We might get confused with this sort of dilemma, same way that we got confused by this one. We're like, whoa, whoa, wait, hold on. What are you asking? I'm not sure. So we could look at it this way. We could say, like, are is a square a type of rectangle, or like squares and rectangles seem to have some relationship to one another, right? Is a square a type of rectangle, or is a rectangle a type of square? A square is a type of rectangle, right? All squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. And this is how we know that, like, ah, rectangle is, we would say, rectangle is the big class, right? It's the genus, and square is a species of that genus. We could do it different. We could say, like, wait a moment, bears and mammals seem like they're related somehow. Are bears a type of mammal, or are mammals a type of bear? And which is it? Bears are a type of mammal. And the way that we know this is that all bears are mammals, but not all mammals are bears. There are aardvarks and giraffes and all kinds of other mammals, right? Human beings. Um, this is actually a really slick way of going about defining a term. Give me the genus first. If we can pin down the genus, if we can pin down the large class that this belongs to, now all we got to do is figure out the speciating difference. What is it that makes this member of the genus different than all the other members of the genus? So if we can figure out that piety is a part of justice, that would be good news. Now we know the genus of piety, right? It's a type of justice. If it turns out that justice is a part of piety, eh, now we know an example of piety, right? Justice is one version of piety but maybe we want to know some of the others. In fact, one of the things that we might do is we might start listing other parts of piety, other different versions of piety, and then we might want to know, all right, so what do they all have in common? This is going to be what makes them all pious. We're going to get that approach in Mino, the next dialogue that we read. But as it turns out, Euthyphro goes this way. He says, ah, piety is a part of justice. And I think he's right there. That pious things are all just, to do what the gods love is always going to be doing the just thing. But maybe doing the just thing isn't always going to be doing what the gods love? Eh, I'm not really, oh, now that I think about it, I'm not really sure about that. Either way, this is exactly how Euthyphro answers the question. Socrates is not in a position to critique his answer. After all, Euthyphro is the knower. Socrates is the one who wants to know. So this is where we go. Piety is a part of justice. So now our next question is, what kind of justice is it? What kind of justice is piety, according to Euthyphro? Feel free to stare at your desk if you like. That's not where the answer is. It's in the text. 
Uh, perhaps it is, but we're not asking what justice is. We're asking what kind of justice is piety. What's that? Yeah, you're on the right track. Clearly it has something to do with religion, right? It's a kind of justice that has to do with the gods. We can get a little more specific. Yes? Can you tell me, what's the, uh, what's the Stephanus number there? 12E. Why do I keep skipping over it? There we go. 12E. Then see if you can explain to me what part of justice is piety that I may tell Miletus, that's his accuser, that I may tell Miletus that now that I have been adequately instructed by you as to what actions are righteous and pious and what are not, he must give up prosecuting me unjustly for impiety. Euthyphro says, well then, Socrates, I should say that righteousness and piety are that part of justice which has to do with the careful attention which ought to be paid to the gods. And that which has to do with the careful attention which ought to be paid to men is the remaining part of justice. So there's the part of justice that's concerned with the gods, and then there's the part of justice that's concerned with human affairs. Not too, not too shabby. That might be interesting. Socrates actually seems pleased with this answer. It's a part of justice. The part that's concerned... It's actually a little bit of an awkward translation there. Uh, an, another translation, and this is, the, this is the sense that Socrates picks up and runs with. It's the concerned with the care for the gods. That's what piety is. It's a species of justice, and the species of justice that's concerned with the care of the gods. That's actually a solid definition. We got the genus, we got the species, maybe we're done. And Socrates is not actually opposed to this definition, but he wants some more clarification. He says, care for the gods? What kind of care do humans show for the gods? As a slave to their master. We get some other options here too, right? Like a horse trainer cares for a horse? Is this how humans care for the gods? That seems unlikely. Like a doctor cares for their patients? Is this how humans care for the gods? What's wrong with those versions? Yeah, the horse trainer is superior to the horse. The doctor is in a position of authority or it's in a kind of a superior position to the patient, but humans are not in that sort of relationship to the gods, right? This would actually, this, this would be no good at all. It's more like the sort of care that a slave offers their master. Yes? I was going to say that the problem with the other examples is uh, that the care offered by like, the huntsman to his dogs or the, the shepherd to the sheep or whatever some of the other examples. Shepherd to the sheep, is a, that's a good one too, right? Yeah. Like, we'll see that one again in Republic. It's the kind of care from the master to something that is benefited by Yeah. The, yeah, this is a version of care where there's, there are benefits flowing from the carer to the cared for, right? Right. And is this not how care for the gods works? This is not, because in this case, uh, the, the people care for the gods from whom the benefits come. Yeah, this is a peculiar version of care where I'm caring for my benefactor. Strange that our example here is like master-slave, right? Because like the slave is saying like, oh, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the one who's benefited by my master, which is actually, this is not too far off from the way that Greeks thought about slavery. And maybe not even all that far off from the way that they practiced slavery. A lot of Greek slavery was, um, uh, a people had been conquered and now here they're like, they've been brought back to Athens. They've been bought, brought back to Greece. They don't really speak the language. They don't really know the customs. Somebody needs to help take care of them. 
the slave is not capable of taking care of themselves in this strange place. And in fact, this is what like, the master of a slave does. They feed, they clothe, they do all these things for the slave. They also benefit greatly from the slave. This is, but we can imagine that this is what was thought of at the time here in this master-slave relationship was that the master cares for the slave. There are other versions of this, by the way, this kind of, this peculiar, we say, like caring up, right? There's a, there's a dynamic between the gods and humans. The gods are up here, the humans are down here, and we're trying to figure out and there's a type of care that goes this way. Euthyphro says there's the sort of care that's concerned with the gods, and then all the rest of justice is concerned with the sort of care that concerns humans. Socrates is, in asking this question of, like, care for the gods, how does one care for the gods, has opened up this new question of, like, maybe it's not about gods and humans. Maybe it's a broader, more abstract question of caring up a power dynamic, caring for those who give us benefits, and really need nothing from us versus maybe other forms of care, like the other way around, right? Where we would say, like, if I'm in a position of superiority over somebody else, I give a different sort of care that goes down. Maybe I would call that beneficence. Maybe I would call it grace. And maybe there's another kind of care that we would say is, like, folks are roughly equal in how they care for one another. Maybe all of these are parts of justice instead of thinking, the part of justice that's concerned with the gods and the part of justice that's concerned with humans, we can think of it in terms of there's a part of justice that goes up the power dynamic. There's a part of justice that goes down the power dynamic. And then there's a part of justice that's concerned with the relationships between folks who are roughly equal with one another. And the relationship between humans and gods and the sort of care that we offer gods is one that definitely goes up. And here's the problem with this. Here's the riddle. That Socrates is not necessarily saying that this is what makes it a bad answer, but it raises a serious question. How do you care for somebody who needs nothing from you? And in fact, they're the person who has given you everything. Everything that you have, you have because of them. And they need nothing at all from you. What sort of care goes that way? If there's a riddle to piety, that's what it is. Yes? Perhaps it's a sort of respect for them, to give them respect for all that they have given you. That's probably a good start, right? Respect or reverence. What is that? I, what is that? What's the cash value of respect, I wonder? What do you do when you respect folks? Is it just an attitude? Does it define certain actions? Andrew. Yeah, I can think of it as supposed a way of like a parent and a child, like in Christmas time, a kid can buy their parents presents, but like the money comes from the parents. Yeah, we might think of it that way. Yeah, yeah. You ever done that? Yeah. Yeah, in fact, like maybe like when you were in elementary school, they had the little secret Santa shop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah where like, I don't know, you bought your dad a, a purple rabbit's foot keychain or something. That's, that's what I bought my dad. <laughs> and uh, it's a little peculiar because... You ask your parents for money so that you can go and buy them a gift, right? It's just kind of like, eh, what kind of gift is... It's a nice gesture. Perhaps it shows respect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Omar, you had something? I guess... I was going to... Loyalty, I guess, kind of... Um, loyalty? Yeah, respect, I, loyalty. Yeah, that, uh, well, like, it, let's just say in terms of the gods, like, every gods, like, your gods gave a lot to the humans. It's like you can, like, sacrifice things to them to, like, show, like, a sense of respect for loyalty. Like, the gods didn't necessarily need their sacrifices... Yeah, we'll get to sacrificing in just a second, but yeah, that's definitely part of it. And loyalty seems, that's, that's a good thing, like, how do you care up? You offer loyalty, you offer respect. It's peculiar because, like, they need nothing from me, and in fact, anything that I'm going to give back up that, that gradient is really going to come from where I'm giving it anyway. Yeah, Gretchen. I would think that thankfulness would be another thing. Thankfulness, yeah, grat yeah. gratitude, yeah. yeah. Sure. And in fact, as, as we're kind of going through these sorts of things, and notice all of, they're all attitudes, right? None of these are actions. Loyalty maybe prescribes some actions. I'm not sure if gratitude prescribes any kind of action. I'm not sure if respect, reverence sometimes folks will say, like, this is what you owe the gods, 
reverence, respect, loyalty, gratitude. This is how you pay this unpayable debt to somebody who's given you everything and needs absolutely nothing from you. We can think of it this way. Let me suggest we kind of take a little bit of a tangent and think, is this only something that concerns humans and gods? Andrew mentioned that there's an analogy to parents and children, right? Is it the same sort of problem? How do children care for their parents? Well, later in life when the parents can't care for themselves, well, we've got that. But while the children are still children and the parents are still parents, do we have the same problem as we do between humans and gods? And are there other sorts of relationships that are just like this? Yeah, yeah. Te yeah Teacher-student or mentor-mentee is another one of these. A lot of teachers will say, like, I learn as much from my students as my students learn from me. It's a nice sentiment. Um, it's total bullshit. No problem. But... Let's, let's, yeah, let's, let's be totally honest about this. You get something from your teachers that you don't really quite give back, right? It's a one-sided relationship. It's not all, one, it's not like benefits are only flowing from the teacher to the student. Some are going back, but it's a, like, your teachers educate you in a way that you don't really educate your teachers. And in fact, for you to try to educate your teachers, just the same as like for children to try to parent their parents, is in fact a little out of line, a little impious, perhaps we might say, a little irreverent. Anything else? Any other relationships like this? Yeah, perhaps. Although, I, I'll, I will point out that like, whenever this question of like, what exactly are the gods like, were they created by humans, like Critias says, or like Protagoras says, or is man the measure of all things, like what's going on? Socrates is perfectly happy to be agnostic about this. He's just like, if, if you say so, then that's what it is. But let's not talk about this. Let's, let's bracket this question of like what the actual nature of the gods are. If there are gods, there's this sort of relationship. And notice Socrates brings it, or he's, he's cashing it out in a way that brings it down to earth in a really accessible way. Now we're talking about relationships between parents and children, which is not completely irrelevant for the dialogue, right? Ah, uh -huh. oh, there we go. Oh, did, did, is this just now? Did you just realize this? That the relationship between humans and gods is a metaphor for the relationship between children and parents. And this is maybe something worth talking about here because Euthyphro is prosecuting his own father for murder as if to play the parent to his father. And there's a peculiar relationship and ambiguity between teacher and student all through this dialogue as well. Who's the real teacher? Who's the real student? Is a student, is somebody who ought to be a student pretending to be the teacher? Oh. oh. Plato has so many layers, guys. So many layers. There's so much irony and performance throughout all of this that, like, you've got to pay attention to, like, what are these things that are, I know, the light just went on as, like, as if to say, like, oh, I get it all of a sudden. You don't necessarily, trust me, you don't necessarily get it yet, but suddenly you have this little key. It's like, you know, now you've got this new lens to look at this dialogue through. And every single platonic dialogue has this little mechanism to it, where there's some theme, some explicit theme, and that explicit theme 
is actually mirrored by some kind of implicit theme, something that's not said outright, something that's maybe performed or that we get exposed to through ironic comments. Yeah? I think it's interesting also just like, it's like the relationship between Euthyphro and his father and humans to the gods. It could be like also a question of like if the gods did something wrong, could humans say anything about it? Just like Euthyphro. Yep. And in fact, we might say, if your parents ever did something wrong, and have they ever done something wrong? Have you ever been in a position where you needed to, you felt the need to criticize your parents? Yes. <laughs> this, this moment seems to come on right about the time that like kids leave home and go off to college, and then they come back to visit their parents, and suddenly it's all criticisms, right? Criticizing your parents is a delicate thing to do. We're not saying that it can't be done. Students criticizing their teachers, it can be done, but it's delicate. You gotta be careful with it. One of the reasons why it's difficult to criticize your parents is because everything you know about right and wrong, where'd you get it from? Well, mostly. Mostly, yeah, or at least the, your head start, right? Like all of your basic intuitions about the difference between right and wrong, you got them from your parents. And now here you are telling your parents that they're wrong and you know the difference between right and wrong. Like everything you got, this is like taking the money from them to buy them a gift and then giving it back, right? Which maybe isn't a terrible thing to do. How could you do this and not be impertinent? Well, one of the ways that you might do it is you could say, I don't really know the difference between, like, it's true. Everything I've learned about the difference between right and wrong, you've taught me. But this is what you taught me. You taught me X, Y, Z. And here you are doing and saying, not X, not Y, not Z. I'm confused. Which is it, Mom and Dad? Does that seem like a familiar strategy? Yeah. Layers. <laughs> Layers. The Socratic method is, in fact, we can think of it as, especially in Euthyphro, is a performance of the pious attitude of the student, or the pious attitude of the person who doesn't know but wants to know, and approach as somebody who claims to know. Let's go ahead and assume, like, sure, sure, you're the one that knows. And when you say something that confuses me, I'm not like, ah, wrong. I'm like, wait a minute, I'm confused. Earlier you said this, and now it seems that you're contradicting yourself. Help me. Help me. I need your help. This is the attitude that a human comes to with, you know, comes to the gods with. I need your help. What do I need your help with? What is it that, and this is when, when we say that it's the sort of care that a slave offers their master. Socrates says, what is this project that the gods are engaged in that they need our help? Is it like they, they need to like plow the fields, and so they get us to plow the field. That's like, some slaves are like slaves that the master wants the field plowed, and the slave is like, all right, I'm going to help you by plowing the field. Sure. What is it that the gods want from us? What is it that your parents want from you? <laughs> Respect, reverence, loyalty. Anybody here a parent? What did you say, love? Love? What, what is the greatest gift your kids could give you? Well, she's, three. she's three. All right. So maybe, maybe project into the, into the future. Appreciation? Again, these are, these are attitudes. What could your child do that would make you the happiest? Make you rich. Make you rich? <laughs> this is like sacrifices, right? Like, well, the, the child will sacrifice and give you material things. Is there a possibility that the greatest gift a child could give their parents is to be a good person? Yeah, yeah is, that, is that what you're going to say? Yeah, the whole point, the whole thing that your parents are trying to do for you is turn you into as good a person as possible. And the best way that you can show any kind of respect or loyalty or appreciation or gratitude for that is to be as good a person as possible. Is youth for doing this?
Yeah, does he, maybe he's doing it with the wrong attitude. He's a little too arrogant about it, but he is doing it. This is, this is your reflection prompt for this week, right? It's like, is Euthyphro actually doing the pious thing? It requires that you're going to have to tell me what the pious thing is. How am I doing on time here? Oh, I'm over by three minutes. No, I'm not. Ah, seven's every Tuesday. I've got another 25 minutes. I kind of I rush things. I might not have enough material now. <laughs> Yeah, good. We have hands. <laughs> Stretch it. Claims to, at least, yeah, right? To. Yeah. Why doesn't Socrates ask him to defend him? Like, this is an interesting question. If Euthyphro claims to know so much about piety, why doesn't Socrates ask Euthyphro to be his counsel, right? Yeah. To like, well, he's asking him to be his counsel before the trial. Why not ask him to step up and like defend him? In court. Well, one of the reasons might be that... Yeah, because Socrates doesn't actually believe that Euthyphro knows what the pious is. Boy, man, I've heard that, I've heard that phrase recently. What do you have to lose? Um, yeah. In fact, would we get the impression that, like, Socrates says he doesn't know what the pious is. Do we maybe have a sense that he's got a better idea of the pious than Euthyphro does. Like he's pretending to know absolutely nothing. Yeah. But this little move here where he starts asking these questions, this kind of like these leading questions, it seems like Socrates has a pretty good idea of where this is going. That maybe he doesn't, he's not ready to say like, ah, here's what the pious is. As a matter of fact, we'll see that this is, Socrates doesn't actually like to start he doesn't like to start off by making a claim. We're going to see in some of the later dialogues, especially when we're looking at a younger version of Socrates, he takes that position a little more. Or where he's amongst friends, where everybody is clearly playing the philosophy game, everybody is well acquainted with the method of Alenkis, Socrates will feel a little more comfortable hazarding a guess. He's like, maybe this is an answer. In fact, we're going to see it in Mino, the next thing that we read. Socrates will very cautiously say, he'll talk about like, here's something that people say, and something rings true about it to me. I'm not sure if I'd commit myself entirely to it, but so it, this, this question of like whether or not you're bold enough to venture forth an answer to the question, this is going to be an important one as we continue to look at more dialogues. It's not a really big one in Euthyphro because what we're dealing with is somebody who's maybe appropriately humble about a very difficult concept, like the concept of the pious, and somebody who is not humble at all. So we, we don't have to worry about, like, is somebody going to be bold enough to hazard an answer so that we can start this cross-examination and maybe in the process learn a little something about the pious? We don't have to worry about that. Euthyphro it has confidence to spare. And in fact, when Socrates gets him to this, like, care for the gods question, and in fact articulates that this is a difficult sort of a thing, the sort of care that a slave offers their master we can think of ways in which the master needs the slave, but that doesn't seem quite right for gods needing humans. I don't know if the gods really do need anything from humans. And when Socrates continues to press Euthyphro on this, Euthyphro says, it's the way that you care for the gods is by praying and sacrificing in ways that are pleasing to the gods, right? And Socrates goes, ah, all right, two issues there. One, and still playing the part of the student, right? I've got two issues with this that I don't understand. One is... When we're talking about like praying and sacrificing, this sounds like, what is praying? Praying is asking for stuff from the gods. Sacrificing is giving stuff to the gods. Do, is it like we, there's commerce between humans and gods as if we're equals or something? I give the gods something, they give me something back. That's not really how it works, is it? You're talking about humans and gods as if they're roughly on the same level, but I thought we had decided that they weren't. This isn't, but by the way, this is not like a totally foreign attitude towards prayer and sacrifice, right? Yeah, or just in general, when you ask, like, what do you do when you pray? According to Facebook and my family, a lot of folks ask for stuff when they pray. 
success. <coughs> yeah. And perhaps when they're doing it well, they're asking for the things that are going to help them become a good person. Health, strength, courage, moral virtue, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Wisdom. Money. Eh. Is money going to make you a better person? So is piety been given by the gods? It might. Is piety given by the gods? Ooh, I don't know. Is respectfulness something that is given to you by your parents? Like as a character trait? It's taught to you, it's it's taught to you by your parents. Okay. Tom, you had your hand up? Did, the, did it pass? Um, yeah, but uh, if we're still talking about the latter stages of the dialogue. Sure. We can focus on that. We have 15 minutes. We can focus on whatever we want. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're going to read one. Parmenides is like young Socrates versus Parmenides. And it's, a, it's an ass beaten. It's, and, it, and Parmenides doesn't even break a sweat. Yep. And perhaps we don't have to, right? Yeah, so the comment, by the way, if it didn't get picked up by the microphone is, I don't really know much about, like, Greek theology, and like this move right here is Socrates saying, like, you don't even have to. This question about the nature of the gods, not relevant. Yep, but go ahead. I suppose I was just going to, like, if I really want to know what the gods wanted, I would look to the scripture, look to an authority figure in the church, and then not have, like, temples and writing that they could go to, if they really want to know this like. Yeah, so there is no, I mean, there is no, the only thing that the Greeks have to go on by this are the myths, right? We can talk about like what the purported actions of the gods are and to try to infer from that what the desires of the gods would be. We also have oracles. They also had oracles. We could go ask a question, and somebody who is in an ecstatic state possessed by the gods or the, under the influence of the gods will tell me things, usually in the form of a riddle. Or, we could just, is it enough? Like, are we satisfied with this idea that, like, what the gods want from us is to be good, right? To be happy, to be the best us that we can be. And any god that wanted something different than that, than that I don't know. Maybe not a god worth worshiping in the first place. you're a child and you're looking up to your parent and you think like they do nothing wrong like really kind of like the because I said so kind of thing like they say this therefore it's the right thing you don't really question it when you're really little but then like I remember one time my mom got me over for speeding and like the police officer came you know to her window and stuff and I was like what is this like I was yeah. so confused like is he above my mom in authority or is yeah. he at my mom or is he like below I couldn't yeah, when you're really young, as far as you're concerned, your parents are God, right? Yep. And then that moment that you realize that they're not, is a, that's an earth-shattering moment. Yeah. yeah. And the trick there is to, is, and the, the trick there is, like, if there's an opportunity for criticism, how do I handle that, right? Without the pendulum swinging completely the other way. Without saying, like, oh my gosh, you're fallible, therefore I know just as much as you? Mm, I don't know about that. Yes. Would you like a microphone for this, by the way? Yeah, because you're really far away from the microphone up in the front. At the very least, we can just have more in the back. And you don't have to speak right into it. You can just leave it on your desk. Um, but anyway, so she's three, but I try not to do ever a because I said so thing. I mean, she's yeah, not, just because she I said so. Nothing from that. So, like, even though she's only three, we tend to like. I explain to her like the as. 
Women as much as you can with a three-year-old. Everything right? that I can about why we can't run into the road because she will get hurt because cars are bigger than her and they are right. going fast right. and they'll squish her. But she's told me that I'm wrong before. And ah, your three-year-old right. has told you that you're she wrong. She has. And every now and then she's right. Um, Whoa. Like it's not always about, you know, like sometimes I'm just wrong about where I put something and she was right. And I apologize to her. Yeah. And, you know, like it's a, a thing that happens now, like respectful yeah. parenting is like, it's like R-I-E or whatever. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, it's certainly a, a but, trend. Yeah. We'll, we'll, see if it, we'll see if it sticks around. We'll see, yeah. yeah. And the, she, she's in like a Montessori and all of that. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's interesting uh, because she, she does look up to me, but she will question me, but not in a way that's rude, in a way yeah. where I can tell that she's trying. That this is what we want, right? Yeah. This like, is what, like want we, we want some think. kind of modicum of respect in the way that that criticism comes to us, right? Mm -hmm. Like, be polite. If you have a real thing you want to know, ask. And isn't that, like, isn't that the attitude that we should have towards everybody, not just towards our parents? Yep. If you're going to criticize somebody, do it in a polite way. Have a valid thing to say yeah. for her. Even like, is it, she is it somehow different? Like, for when a parent criticizes a child, should they do it in a very different way than a child criticizes a parent? I, I never... I, if I ever... I think there are maybe, like, a few times where I've said something and I immediately regretted it, which is inevitable with parenting. But yep. I never try to just tell her she's wrong with no reason behind it. So what, how would you do it? Instead usually, of just saying, like, hey, kid, you're wrong. I try to find it on her own. You'd like um, for them to find it on their own. Like, I try to point out things casually. Like, if her shoes are on the wrong feet, that probably doesn't feel very good when she tries to run. Yeah. So I might ask her, hey, when you look at your feet, do you notice how the shoes are going away from each other? Rather yeah. than towards each other. Rather than saying, you put your shoes on wrong yeah. and fix it now. It seems like we have a possible dilemma. The shoes can either point away from each other or point towards one another. Generally which do you think good. they ought to be? Exactly. Yeah. Like, which way do your feet go? Yeah. How does it feel better? Which is like, like this, right? Yeah. <laughs> like this. Is that the best way to teach somebody something? Is to let them discover it for themselves? Yeah, if you discover that you're wrong, now you know why you were wrong. If somebody just tells you that you're wrong, maybe you believe them. <laughs> and even if you do, awesome. you don't know it's why. It's a fleeting thing. You don't right? believe it for long. Yeah, you haven't really learned anything of interest. <laughs> yes, keep going. Oh, um, just when we were talking about it earlier, it made me think of this book I read. It's called um, Till, Till I Have Faces by C.S. Lewis, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. But it's about Greek myth mythology and they have a really good quote in the beginning and it um, states when you're a child and you see that your parents are wrong for the first like when you discover that your parents aren't a god your world kind of comes crashing down but when you discover the gods aren't really go like gods I guess like they're not godly mm -hmm. um, your whole world is crashing down yeah 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 for sure it's a, it, it would it would be an earth shattering realization right Especially if you've been, you've been operating under the because I said so attitude, right? When suddenly, bec because I said so, if because I said so was like, that was the grounding reason for everything that's right and wrong and how things ought to be and how they ought not to be, and suddenly that evaporates, now you're compassless. It's a very disorienting feeling. The Greek term for it is aporia, this recognition that there's an impasse. There's no way through. You're stuck. And you, you kind of like don't know which way is up anymore. Socrates is a master at provoking this moment of aporia. At getting you to realize that what you thought you knew, you don't know. What you thought was right is not necessarily the case. And they're big things. It's not where did I leave my keys. It's what's the difference between what's right and what's wrong. And now you're just kind of like, oh, I don't know how to proceed. And understandably, folks get upset. They might even kill you for stuff like that. You know, sometimes being told uh, what you should do is an always a bad thing instead of figuring out for yourself. I mean, I would really hate it if I was a kid and my parents told me not to run into the street and I kind of figured out 
Yeah, I should run into the street as soon as the car gets me. Yeah, that would kind of suck. That's a tough lesson to learn, yeah. yeah. I, I can maybe learn to have my shoes pointing inwards rather than outwards you have to balance. through experimentation. Yeah, but don't stick the butter knife in the electrical outlet. Yeah. That's maybe not one to learn through experience. I don't know. She, I, yeah, I have like a knee jerk. I, I like kind of scream when she goes near an outlet every now and then if she looks like she, like she almost poked one yesterday. Yeah. Basically jumped on her. Which but is a bit of negative reinforcement, right? That creates a very yeah, unpleasant she sensation she for her. Terrifying. And she's like, whoa, I want to avoid that. Some folks will do that with a little slap on the wrist. Some folks will do it with a, a much, a, yeah, a stronger slap on the bum. Some folks will do it with, a, like, go get a switch from the yard. <laughs> yeah, I tend to the whole, you shouldn't do that, it'll shock you, and, like, you'll have to go to the hospital and then to the doctor, and we know how that yeah. feels. You've been to the doctor. Yeah, and in fact, yeah, we might even have these questions of, like, should I say, like, and you'll die, and I'll be very sad, and they'll be like... <laughs> I, I any like, any three-year-old is going to now have to wrap their mind around the possibility that someday they'll stop existing. One yeah. of her friends, he's, like, he, he's not four yet, but he's, like, doing that already, and it is, like, my, I, I don't even understand how he is so, like, out there, but he, like, asks about death. What happens after you die? Where will I go when I die, Mommy? And They're big like, questions. Yes, and like for a three-year-old to like understand, I feel like we don't credit children enough, but like it, it's, they, they have the like most innocent view of it, like the purest view of it. And how do you answer that when you, you don't, don't know the I answer, right? Say, I don't know. I don't know, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. And maybe even like better would be, I don't know, what do you think? Let's start a dialogue, Let them right? Discovery. The attitude that Socrates takes as a... Wait, is he a teacher or a student in this dialogue? He's a teacher. Provocateur? He's both. He's both? He's not a provocateur just to get a rise out of them, right? He's, he's trying to steer the ship a little bit. He wants to know what piety is. He definitely, yeah, he genuinely does want to know what piety is. He's ironically suggesting that Euthyphro knows, or ironically agreeing with Euthyphro that he knows. Is he a student or is he a teacher? Is he both? And we might come to this, doesn't matter. Is what he's going to do exactly the same either way? If he's a student, to be a good student, what do you do? What do your, what do your teachers want you to do as a good student? Pay close attention to what they say? Ask questions when you get confused. Point out places where, like, uh, I'm, I'm not understanding. How are you going to do this as a teacher? Listen carefully to what your students say. Point out places where, like, things seem confused. Say, like, ah, I'm not really clear on what you're saying right here. How would you do this with an equal? Two folks come to the question, what is piety? And both of them are like, I don't know, and the other one's like, I don't know either. How are we going to proceed there? That's actually going to be a riddle that we encounter in our next dialogue. Mino will get to a point where Mino says to Socrates, I think I know the answer to this question, and Socrates is like, for reals? That's a big question. Please teach me. And we go through the same thing. Mino is like, of course I know the answer. And then Socrates is like, well, well, tell me. And Mino says, like, here it is. And Socrates goes, goes, Socrates says, like, well, no, I'm confused because blah, 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 blah. And Mino's like, oh, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. And here's the answer. And Socrates goes, yeah, but, like, but nah, this and this and this. And then eventually Mino says, you're trying to mess with me here, man. We have an ad hominem breakdown. And then Socrates says, I don't think you know. Maybe you did before, but you seem like you don't know. And I don't know. You don't know. I don't know. Let's try to figure out together. And Mino says, well, how are we going to do that if neither of us knows? And this is, this is the big riddle that we encounter in our next dialogue. Keep your eyes peeled for it. I am going to make as a Herculean effort at our next meeting. We're going to try to get through Mino in one shot. None of this breaking it into two pieces. Part of how we're going to do that is we're going to rock it through the first half where we get pretty much the same little exchange as we get in Euthyphro. Somebody offers forth an answer, Socrates criticizes the answer, and we kind of go through, go through that way. 
up until the midpoint when we get to the, the real riddle in Mino. Um, seems like everybody's ready to go. It's one of those situations where the, the students tell the teacher when the class is over. What's that? If I have more thoughts about this? I have plenty of thoughts about this, but I, I, think, I think we've reached a stopping point. Um, see you guys on Wednesday. Keep your eyes peeled for the new reading assignment and reading quiz. All right.